Right, hello everyone. Um, I hope you can all hear us okay. So a, a huge welcome to, to this event, um, which is, is really our team from University College Hospital in uh, London in the UK, sharing their experience of using CPAPs or continuous positive airways pressure devices for treating COVID patients um, over the last few months. So just to introduce myself, I'm Rebecca Shipley, I'm a Professor of Healthcare Engineering here at University College London, which is the, the kind of sister university to, to um, University College London Hospital. And um, I've been working with some of the teams around um, manufacture of CPAP devices here in the UK. Just to, just to start off, we just wanted to explain a bit of the structure of the event and a bit of housekeeping. Um, so we're going to start with a 30 minute presentation that's going to be shared between um, two of our clinical colleagues, so Professor Mervyn Singer and Dr. Raynor Aston. Um, we're then going to follow that with, a, with an open question and answer session. Hopefully you can all see the, the question and answer function. So as you're going through, please do put your questions in there and we will, we will endeavour to get to as many of them as possible um, during that 30 minutes um, question and answer time towards the end. We've got, we're very conscious that we've got a really wide audience today, which is absolutely brilliant, um, from all sorts of countries across the whole world, and it's really phenomenal to have you all listening in. We, we were particularly conscious that, that this has been circulated to various teams in Latin America. So after the event, we will have, um, well, actually, sorry, during the event, there's going to be links that you can pull up, which will provide the translated slides in Portuguese and Spanish that um, if you would like to have those up and um, whilst Mervyn and Brandon are giving their presentations, of course, you're very welcome to download them. Unfortunately, we weren't able to do it for all languages that might be present today, but, you know, if there's any issues um, or you've got any questions or need further translations, after the event, then please do get in touch. As I said, please do use the question and answer function. You can also upvote um, different questions by liking them. So if you like questions that other people have asked, we'll also keep a track of that so we can kind of prioritise which ones we go to first. And then the final point to make is that this session is being recorded and we're going to share it online afterwards. Again, um, in English, but with um, English, Spanish and Portuguese subtitles. Um, so you will be able to watch it subsequently and share it with other contacts. And again, if there's any other languages or support you can provide around translation into other languages, we'd be really, really grateful to talk to you. So without further, um, further um, delay, I'm going to pass on to my colleagues, um, Mervyn and Ronan. I think, Mervyn, are you going to start? I think you're on mute. Can I? Oh, thank you very much indeed, Becky. Um, huge pleasure to uh, join everyone from around the world. Uh, can I ask a favour? Somebody's written that there's an echo, so if everyone could please go to mute, uh, that might help in terms of uh, um, better audio uh, capabilities. So um, I'll give a, the first sort of 10 minutes or so. My name's Mervyn Singer. I'm a professor of intensive care medicine at University College London. Um, so I'll start off talking about the role of CPAP, how the use of CPAP in COVID has hopefully benefited patients and uh, shifted policies by governments and healthcare bodies and, and, then Ro and a little bit of our data. And then Ronan will talk more about the practicalities of delivering CPAP and training people after me. Next slide, please. So I don't need to tell anyone that uh, COVID is a horrible, horrible disease, the likes of which we've not come across. And approximately 15% of patients admitted to hospital, if not more, require more than just face mask oxygen to su sufficiently oxygenate their blood. You know, so as was found in China in January and then Italy in February, there was this sudden rush of critically ill patients, which essentially overwhelmed both the critical care, bed availability and ventilator resources. Next slide, please. So what did they do? They turned to using CPAP and high flow nasal oxygen. Next slide, please. 
so the pros and cons of CPAP. Well, essentially, it's been around um, for nearly a hundred years. That was the first description of um, CPAP. So it's well established as a means of improving oxygenation in patients with respiratory failure. Clearly, if you are limited in the number of ventilators in the number of critical care beds, it protects that very scarce resource for those in real need of a ventilator. And as you'll hear from Ronan, that's something that we pushed here very heavily at the hospital we work at. Um, clearly, you don't need the experienced staff who can cope with ventilators to manage CPAP. The patients are spontaneously breathing and there are issues with ventilating patients. It can cause damage to the patient directly from ventilator-induced lung injury and other complications related to sedation and so forth. Next, please. Obviously, there are drawbacks. Potentially, there was this fear about an increased risk of viral transmission to healthcare workers. And there's this theoretical risk of spontaneous breathing induced lung injury. In COVID, patients were often taking very large tidal volumes, creating high transpulmonary pressures. And so there's this theoretical risk of lung trauma induced by these very large spontaneous breaths. And potentially, if you, the patient carries on for too long, there's a delay in intubation and ventilation that may actually potentially compromise uh, their lives. Next, please. However, uh, as in a lot of new things, to paraphrase Franklin Roosevelt, after the Great Depression in the 1920s, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Next, please. So at the beginning of the crisis, there were lots of documents coming out. This is uh, the American Society of Anesthesiologists. When considering a procedure for a patient with known or suspected COVID infection, when they have acute respiratory failure, it may be prudent to proceed directly to endotracheal intubation because non-invasive ventilation, CPAP or BiPAP, may increase the risk of infectious transmission. However, clearly they hadn't read the literature. Uh, we wrote this editorial in Lancet Respiratory Medicine. Next, please. There was this other very nice review from uh, some Canadian doctors in anesthesiology, and I've highlighted one of their comments. They wrote that concern that the use of non-invasive positive pressure ventilation or high flow nasal oxygen specifically leads to worse environmental contamination is not substantiated by the current available evidence. And I would certainly agree with their uh, distillation of evidence. And there was this nice paper in JAMA showing people just coughing can generate a, a cloud of virus that can stretch seven or eight meters. So arguably a poorly fitting face mask may be more injurious than a, a well-fitting CPAP mask or hood. Next, please. So I think as a criticism of what we did in the UK, we didn't find out early enough what people were doing in China and Italy. And I was informally talking to friends and colleagues over there. This is uh, from a guy called uh, Bindu, um, who's, as you see, from his moniker, he's uh, very high up in Chinese critical care. So in fact, when there's a, a problem in China, a healthcare disaster somewhere in the country, he's sent from Beijing to lead the critical care effort. And he was sent to Wuhan when um, COVID blew up there. And I asked him a lot of different questions and he basically wrote that non-invasive ventilation, high flow nasal oxygen is everywhere. Yes, there may be a high failure rate. Delayed intubation may eventually lead to death, but you'll probably understand, he wrote, that when you have hundreds of patients with severe hypoxemia all coming at once, you just don't have the resources for invasive mechanical ventilation. So they had to adapt very quickly. Next, please. And the same in Italy. Um, 
before uh, it started coming to Britain, we were getting uh, lots of uh, details about the problems they were facing in Italy. And as you'll see here, next slide please, in the picture, they were showing patients being managed with CPAP. So helmet CPAP, and so clearly that's what they'd gone to in a big way in Italy. Next, please. And so here, for example, is uh, from one region in Italy. These are their guidelines. Next, please. And you can see CPAP featured heavily in their guidelines. So early on, if the patients remained hypoxemic, CPAP was trialed very quickly to see if they would cope. Uh, a friend of mine was one of the leaders of the emergency response team in the Lombardy region around Milan. And he told me over the phone that he hasn't got any hard data, but he was absolutely sure CPAP was the answer. And I spoke to many other intensivists around Italy, and in their experience, somewhere between 30 to 70% of patients treated with non-invasive ventilation, high-flow nasal oxygen could be kept off ventilators. Crucially, they didn't see any healthcare workers becoming patients themselves. Yes, they were wearing PPE, but importantly, there wasn't a big risk to healthcare workers and they weren't experiencing problems with oxygen supply. Next slide, please. And so in the UK, uh, we learned after a few weeks that perhaps um, it was safe to use CPAP and appropriate. And as they wrote, um, CPAP may be of benefit, it's now clear CPAP may be of benefit to patients earlier on in the disease process than first thought, and may prevent deterioration of some patients to prevent them needing invasive ventilation. So UK policy changed, you know, A, from the experience Belatedly, we learned from the experience in Italy and in China, but also from our own initial experiences in the United Kingdom. Next slide, please. Sorry, you're going forwards, please. That came out on the 28th of March. However, in our hospital, because we've been hearing these messages from Italy, from China, uh, we started preparing right from the outset to think about using CPAP early on to look after our intensive care and our ventilator resource. And so we had great buy-in from the doctors, the nurses, the hospital administration that this was an appropriate and probably safe thing to do. And there's a picture of our hospital on a lovely sunny day in London. Next slide, please. So we had good buy-in and we developed a clinical algorithm which began at the front door of the hospital. So the emergency physician started managing patients early on, assessing the need for, if they were very bad, to be ventilated immediately, if they weren't so bad, to see if they needed a trial of CPAP and how they managed with that. Next slide, please. And so we had, this is the latest um, algorithm. This is, we have a, an app that's downloadable, um, but this was quite a straightforward guideline as to how to manage patients that had a trial of oxygen, depending on how they did, their breathing rate, their saturation, work of breathing, they could be trialed on CPAP. And then if appropriate, they could go on to a, an intubation pathway. So we could clearly delineate which patients needed what level of support. Next slide, please. Oops, go back, please. Thank you. Um, so the important thing, and Ronan will talk about this, was at the same time um, we were preparing to train doctors and nurses who weren't familiar with CPAP to be able to look after these patients. And we clearly needed to buy more machines. We only had 12 standalone CPAP machines in the whole hospital. 
However, none were available to purchase. And so obviously with the engineers at UCL, we thought it would be a good idea to see if we couldn't make our own CPAP device. And that was the, the origins of the UCL Ventura device. Next, please. And we reverse engineered a, a very old but still working effective wall CPAP device called the Whisper Flow that had been designed about 30 years ago. And the beauty of it was it's very simple. It's got an on off knob and you just can twist the one knob to change the oxygen concentration and one knob to change the flow. And so there's, it's purely mechanical. There's no electrics in it, nothing. So it's relatively quick and simple to reverse engineer. And literally within a few days, the uh, a Mark I model as shown here was developed in combination with our engineers at UCL and next slide please the um, people at Mercedes Formula One and again they very quickly modified and improved upon the Mark I version to improve both the inside of the Ventura device but also the patient's circuit to deliver improvements in oxygen use of up to 70%. So clearly the original whisper flow device was very oxygen hungry and there was a considerable improvement with the device that's now being used clinically. Next slide please. I mentioned obviously the involvement of uh, the uh, wonderful people at Mercedes who build the engines for the Formula One racing cars and they were tremendous and uh, when it was ready and we had the regulatory approval it became the lead item on the BBC on the 29th of March in the evening it came out and then the following day next slide please you know, it essentially went global. So the story uh, went round the world to many, many different countries, television, media, etc. So clearly it was a good news story that something was being developed in quick time to hopefully help patients. Next slide, please. So the final minute or two of my talk has the CPAP made a difference. So we don't have any randomized controlled trial data. I can talk about our experience at UCH. Next slide, please. So in total, our hospital admitted 468 patients of whom a quarter received CPAP at that time. Importantly, you know, many patients who, because of age, underlying frailty, comorbidities would not be appropriate for invasive ventilation could still be offered CPAP as a ceiling of care. And in fact, 38% of the 117 patients who got CPAP were deemed not appropriate for intubation and mechanical ventilation. And of these patients who were frail, elderly, had comorbidities, a quarter of them survived. And I would guess that many of these patients would have died had they not had this additional support. Next slide, please. And of those patients who were for full escalation, about half were eventually intubated. So half these patients were kept off a ventilator and that allowed us to take many patients from other hospitals because we still had the bed capacity. So the overall survival in patients who are for full escalation was 71%. And these were obviously the sick end of the cohort. Next slide, please. Can we predict, this is my last slide, can we predict who will uh, do well or badly on CPAP? I, I think we can. Um, we're looking at those who came to the intensive care unit some of them had CPAP as a ceiling of care. And as I mentioned before, you know, we managed to keep a lot of patients off CPAP. They didn't need to be ventilated. Some either died with CPAP as a ceiling of care or they needed to be ventilated. Next, please. 
And you can see here, in terms of the respiratory parameters, this is just before they started CPAP. So the median oxygen requirement was 80%. So these were sick patients. They had a respiratory rate of over 30 and a PF ratio, this is in kilopascals, which is around 13 kilopascals. So if you're millimeters of mercury, that's 100 millimeters of mercury. So that's on the borderline from moderate to severe respiratory failure. And as you can see, there was no clear discrimination between these groups in terms of patients who would manage on CPAP or fail. Next, please. But interestingly, we found inflammatory markers and other markers in the blood did discriminate. So C-reactive protein, we found it's, just, I won't show the data now, but patients who evolve from oxygen to CPAP to ventilation have a much higher CRP, but those who failed CPAP had a much higher CRP initially, this is on ICU admission, compared to those who managed. Likewise, I'm showing here the pro-BMP level, there was again a very different response. These patients had more inflammatory biomarkers and more evidence of ventricular dysfunction. So it's an interesting uh, differentiation as to how we might be able to detect these patients. I'll now hand over to Ronan and he can talk about some of the fine detail. Thank you. Thank you, Mervyn. Um, so my name is Ronan Astin. I'm one of the respiratory consultants, a consultant in ventilation medicine here at UCLH. And I was given the task during this pandemic to, to set up and lead a CPAP ward within the hospital. So um, hopefully from what Mervyn has presented, uh, you are now convinced that there is a role for CPAP in this COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but if so, and before you launch into setting up a CPAP ward, I think there are some important practicalities to think about. And the aim for this talk, I think, is to give some insight and maybe some tips um, from the experience that we've had here in London that might help you in the endeavor of setting up a unit to support patients in this way. And next slide, please. So when I said about thinking about the challenges we worked through, I think they fit into five main categories. And those are named here, environment, oxygen capacity, the local environment in terms of flow capacity, um, equipment, and that's both CPAP and mask interfaces, and also staff training, as mentioned earlier. Next slide. So if we think about environment first, and really I'm talking about the very local environment to the patient on CPAP therapy, and really tackling the most thorny issue perhaps in CPAP as a therapy in COVID-19, and that is the, uh, the concern regarding droplet spread and aerosolization and the risk that that poses to healthcare workers. And as Mervyn explained, uh, you know, there's lots of received opinion now that this is safe. And that's based on data, not a, a huge amount of data, but whilst I started off a little bit concerned Actually, when you look at the data in full, it's very reassuring. So I've put three references here on this slide, which you can look up later, but um, just running through them quickly. Anita Simmons group in 2010 looked at um, the generation of droplets or aerosolization from patients with chorizal symptoms provided with NIV. And what they found was that in fact, NIV only generated droplets and did not aerosolize. And those droplets, because of their size, fell within one meter of the patient mask um, on CPAP or NIV. So that's reassuring, saying that only perhaps people nursing patients in that range need to wear uh, protective equipment. Then if we look at the papers by Huey and his, his group in 2015 and 2019, they used a, a simulator to model um, the dispersion of droplets whilst using CPAP specifically, rather than the NIV in this case. And what they found in both papers was that in fact, with a CPAP delivered by face mask, there is no dispersion 
of droplets or aerosolization from the mask itself. So the interface, if the mask fits appropriately, is very good. What they did find was that there is, of course, exhalation of air from uh, vents or ports. When there's an exhalation port, that vent uh, reaches approximately 60 um, centimeters or so. Um, when there's vented masks, that uh, dispersion is spread over a shorter area, but wider in terms of its dispersion. Next slide. So taking that together and adding in there that in the Anita Simmons paper in 2010, they show that whilst the 60 centimeter exhalation plume from the port is present, that can be almost obliterated by placing an, uh, an antiviral filter on the exhalation port. So what do we do? Well, we used non-vented masks with a filter attached to the exhalation port and paid close attention to the mask fitting. So in that way, we could be quite confident that in fact, there's very little droplet dispersion at all. When you then consider that we made every attempt where possible to place patients in side rooms until capacity became an issue and only then moved to the open bay environment, and considering that nursing and doctor and therapy staff were all dressed in level three full PPE, I think we can be reassured that the risk to healthcare workers is in fact extremely low. Now we don't have robust data yet on the rate of infection in, in our workforce, but what I can say as a, an indication is that uh, of my five specialist respiratory nurses who spent six to ten weeks exclusively managing patients on CPAP therapy, only one of those nurses actually has positive antibodies, suggesting that only one actually had COVID-19 infection. Next slide. So before we launch into uh, using CPAP on mass in a hospital setting, um, it's of course important to consider the, the hospital oxygen supply. Uh, stories emanating from Italy, as, as Mervyn explained, suggested patient, patient numbers up to perhaps 100 patients on CPAP at a time in a single hospital. And hospitals aren't really built to support those kind of numbers. Um, in the UK, most UK hospitals have oxygen supplied via vacuum insulated evaporators, which have a limited flow capacity. And the risk is that if demand excess, exceeds that supply, there's a risk of rapid pressure drop in the oxygen supply lines, putting patients at risk. Next slide, please. So what we did, first of all, was set up an oxygen task force for the hospital. And this was at the very beginning of the pandemic. And that task force primarily, initially at least, was aimed at understanding what our capacity was. So that was with close working with our engineers and medical gas suppliers, we understood what the capacity of the VIE was and whether we could increase it. In our case, we could, which gave us great relief. Alongside that, we developed a, a system by which to measure the oxygen usage on a six hourly basis and then averaged over 24 hours. And what that allowed us to do was to look at both the percentage of capacity use, but also trends in use. So we could trend, look at a trend of increased use over days and predict when we might have issue. Alongside that, and thankfully we didn't need to employ, we did develop contingency plans for the event of lacking capacity of oxygen supply. And those included lowering saturation aimed for patients during that time, and also switching to less oxygen demanding equipment. Next slide, please. But it's not just the overall oxygen flow capacity that determines whether an area can support CPAP and how many CPAP devices it can support. Because in fact, the local flow area is... Apologies. The local flow area is uh, capacity is determined by facts including the pipe layout and the pipe caliber. So actually, in order to understand where best placed CPAP might be, you need to understand the engineering architecture. Specifically, things like the branching network of pipes means that terminal points in the pipe network will have or be more exposed to low flow than proximal points. Next slide, please. So what did we do to control for these factors? Again, the answer is careful planning where possible and trying to understand the environment. 
So that meant that we looked at what the various flow capacities were of various areas within the hospital and then understood the flow capacity of various areas within that ward. Next slide, please. What this looked like in a real world sense was this. So this was the ward that we set up and we understood that the capacity for that ward was 420 litres per minute. We understood the gradient of that uh, pressure across the ward and also within individual bays. And in so doing, understood which measurement points to take on a daily basis uh, with a manometer uh, measuring the walled pressure so that we could track any change as increasing amounts of CPAP was deployed. Next slide, please. However, knowing the flow limit of the area only helps if you understand the flow demand of the CPAP devices you're using. And that's important because not all CPAP is equal. Different CPAP devices vary in their ability to perform uh, in terms of pressure and uh, providing an assured FI2, but also in their auction demand and their cost. So putting together this comparison table, we can look at broadly the four different groups of CPAP delivery device. And here in the top uh, row, we have the dedicated bespoke hospital ventilator, which is indeed extremely good. It provides an assured high FI2 with a, a high pressure range. Um, it demands little oxygen, but its cost is very high and there is scarcity. And for that reason, many hospitals in the UK and elsewhere uh, turn to domiciliary sleep apnea devices, the kind of devices that we use to treat sleep apnea um, in the community. And they have advantages of being relatively cheaper, um, again, having a very low oxygen cost and having a decent pressure range. But as I'll explain in the coming slides, they have a major limitation in not being able to be uh, provide an assured oxygen level. Just back one slide. And this is where the UCL Ventura really has an advantage because it can provide a very high level of oxygen at an assured level with a good enough pressure range because although it's limited in its range, it provides a good 10 centimeters, which we found was uh, was sufficient for the large majority of patients in our trust. The demand is moderate in terms of oxygen cost and the cost is low. Finally, the disposable CPAP kits that we did procure um, have some advantage in again offering a high assured oxygen level um, with a decent pressure range and their cost per device is low, although they're single patient use. However, as you'll see in the coming slide, the oxygen flow demand is very high. Next slide. So just bringing through some data that we generated in our hospital to try and understand this. Um, whilst the manufacturers will uh, likely refer to a, an average auction use of 15 litres a minute with the bespoke hospital dedicated devices, that auction demand does vary according to the peak provided, the respiratory rate and the um, required FiO2, such that actually with an FiO2 around 90%, and a high respiratory rate, similar to that that we were seeing in some of the COVID patients or a large number of COVID patients. In fact, it demanded more like 30 liters a minute. And it's also worth saying here that with additional leaks or a poorly fitting mask, there can be a significant increase in the auction cost, almost doubling uh, the auction costs. Hence the importance of paying attention to mask leak. Next slide. Uh, and these data speak to the point I was making earlier regarding the limitation of the domiciliary devices. Here you can say, see that by supplementing the domiciliary device with 15 litres of oxygen uh, added at the level of the mask, you can increase the FI2 to around 60% with regular breathing. However, as respiratory rate increases, the FI2 decreases. And that's been proven in, in papers prior to this pandemic, uh, even with a, uh, a correlation um, shown by this paper in Smolsky. Um, and this really does limit the availability or the suitability of this device for treating patients in uh, suffering COVID-19 respiratory failure. Next slide, please. Mentioning briefly the disposable walled CPAP devices, just to demonstrate those high flow uh, demanded by those um, pieces of kit. You can see at an FiO2 around 90%, the auction flow demand is 130 litres a minute. 
So this is really significantly higher than other devices and really does limit the number of patients that you can treat with this kit in a given environment. Compare that to the UCL Ventura device and you can see a marked difference between the flow demand, such that at an FiO2 of 60% and a high respiratory rate, only 20 liters or so a minute of oxygen is required. And even at 90%, that only increases to about 47 liters per minute. So a clear advantage there in terms of the oxygen demand. I'd also mention at this point that uh, using the helmet, which was um, favored in, in many Italian hospitals, the oxygen demand is also reasonable. One caveat I would mention at this point though, is that it's important to pay attention to the flow necessary when setting the uh, UCL Ventura up, such that the flow should be decreased to that required to provide the PEEP within the device. Next slide, please. So understanding this, understanding uh, the flow capacity for our ward environment and understanding the flow demand of our various CPAP devices, we could then build a system which allowed us to monitor the flow demanded in our ward environment. Now we did this digitally because we have an electronic health record system that allows us to do that, but there's no reason why this can't be done manually, although obviously a bit more labor intensive. But this was really useful for me when trying to run a ward through this pandemic so that I could understand in our case, any time of the day, what flow was being demanded in any given CPAP ward area, allowing me to step in should the flow demand increase anywhere near a limiting level. Next slide, please. So final couple of slides, and I want to spend just a minute or two on staff training, because we wouldn't have been able to run the system that we ran or have the success that we had without having the nursing staff and therapy staff, as well as the medical staff, available, available to care for the patients and manage the CPAP devices. And I imagine many hospitals are like ours insofar as the ICU capacity was limited. So it meant we had to provide CPAP outside of ICU and with nurses that weren't used to delivering CPAP therapy. But we managed this and we trained over 100 nurses in, in just under 10 days in CPAP therapy for COVID-19. And that uh, was really based on a two hour teaching session of the theory and practice of CPAP therapy, complemented by a, an hour bedside session um, of practical training, and then further specific training on particular devices as they came into use. But alongside that, we uh, deployed our very limited number of really highly trained nurses within the, the general shifts of the ward so that supervision and support was available to the nurses as their skill levels increased. Supplementing that with a really close tie and link to ICU meant that we always had support on hand. And that meant that within the first four weeks, although we began with a patient to nurse ratio of two patients per nurse, we could move that to one to three and had plans to limit that further to one to four, although we didn't need to do that in the end. So my final slide is this one, which I think neatly summarizes some of the advantages of CPAP therapy in a hospital um, organizational sense. So alongside the survival benefits that Mervyn pointed out, what this graph demonstrates is that in the purple bars is represented the intubated patients um, in our hospital. The blue bars represent patients in ICU uh, being provided CPAP therapy that the green and orange bars represent CPAP therapy provided outside of ICU. And you can probably appreciate that it was only by way of providing the CPAP outside of ICU that we were enabled to provide the intubated and ventilated support for patients in the ICU. And just emphasizing Mervyn's point, the lighter purple bar are patients that we managed to transfer in from other hospitals who were struggling in the crisis. So CPAP therapy benefits the patients, but also the system as a whole. Next slide. Thank you very much. And I'll pass back to Becky now to host the questions and answers. Brilliant. Thank you so much, um, Mervyn and Ronan. That was fantastic and very illuminating. So I, I think actually many of, many of the questions that have come up on the chat have already been answered to some extent, but nonetheless, I think we'll go through them and just check this, um, as to whether everything's covered. Uh, there are a few questions that have come in around um, humidification and if that's necessary with CPAP circuits. 
Um, I don't know which of you would prefer to take that, but okay. Ronan, go for it. Martin, we can chip in. Um, so we uh, began the pandemic not using humidification. Um, in fact, on the CPAP ward, um, almost entirely we didn't add humid humidification to the facilities. And that was based around concerns about droplet dispersion or aerosolization. What I can say on that was that we didn't run into any difficulties with uh, sputum clearance. We didn't have um, particularly episodes of uh, mucus plugging. So I don't think that harmed patients. But similarly, if we have another wave, I won't, I will probably be employing humidification in our circuits um, it, in contrast to our, our previous experience, because I don't think there's a risk with it. And I think there probably is some benefit of it. Mervyn, what do you think? Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you. Um, I think one of the things we found working in intensive care that often the patients, when they got ventilated, initially we were using dry circuits and we were having a lot of problems with them. Um, very thick secretion. So we were needing to use or catch up with a lot of humidification, um, a lot of mucolytics. So I think we shifted and again, as Ronan was saying, we got confidence that yes, you could use humid humidification safely. So even if you're using a dry circuit with CPAP, I think even if you give the patient lots of breaks and give them you know, nebulizers or a break on high flow nasal oxygen or something and make sure the other thing, these patients, because of their breathing, they can dehydrate themselves quite actively. So I think the other thing we learned is to make sure they remained well hydrated. You don't want to fluid overload them, but you don't want to let them get too dried out. Super, thank you both. And um, so another question that's come in, but for the patients who had CPAP and then didn't progress to needing um, ventilation, how long on average would one of them expect to be on a CPAP for? Well, the data we had on from the intensive care side was the average duration on CPAP was about two days, two to three days. We, we had one patient who um, actually managed on CPAP and lasted for two weeks. Um, so that's relatively unusual but usually um, it was a few days we had you know there was no cut-off point you know we had some mm. people needing CPAP for five days a week 15 days but on average it was, it was about two to three days I, I don't know if Ronan wants to add from his uh, experience yeah, so looking at the patients on um, the CPAP ward outside of ICU and uh, probably as a cohort as a whole um, the mean time was around four days so that was, that was shorter than I, I'd modeled in terms of service provision. I thought it'd be more like seven days, in fact, with a, with a slower wean. But what we saw was in fact that patients wean uh, quicker. But as Mervyn said, the range was large. And I think importantly, we also had plenty of patients who were on CPAP for longer and survived. So that's not to say that at day five, if they're not yet off, to then stop. Um, it's, it's more complex than that. And I think one other point on that was the signals in our data, which I think are interesting insofar as we didn't see an immediate um, difference in response to CPAP between those that survived and those that didn't or needed intubation. But after about 48 hours, the two groups did seem to separate. So don't be too, or I tell myself on next wave, don't be too concerned if a patient doesn't immediately respond, but after a couple of days, you'd hope to be able to see um, improving thereafter. Yeah. Brilliant, thank you both very much. So there's also a few questions around the comparison between CPAP and BiPAP or high flow nasal. Um, I don't know if either of you would like to comment on that. Yeah. Do you want to go first, Ronan? Uh, yes, um, I'm sure Mervyn can add uh, more insight after me. But um, So we use CPAP and not NIV. Um, so with NIV, with the higher inspiratory pressure, it provides a larger minute ventilation, tighter volume. And whilst we weren't too concerned about silly with the CPAP pressures we were using, I think we would have been concerned to some degree with uh, induced lung injury with high levels of inspiratory pressure in NIV. 
especially with the in the phase of very compliant loans. Um, add to that the fact that it didn't seem necessary. So we used CPAP and didn't need to revert to NIV. Uh, at the beginning, there was also anxiety regarding, again, the aerosolization and droplet uh, dispersion, which is higher with the higher pressures. So why expose ourselves to that risk if there's no benefit to be had and possibly risk to the lung? In terms of high flow therapy, again, this is an area where I think my opinion has changed over time. So initially I was very concerned about the oxygen demand of the, of the devices. And I was also concerned that um, in terms of dispersion, the values are highest with high flow compared to CPAP or NIV, and particularly a risk when the nasal cannula displace. So again, adding in a risk to auction supply, risk to healthcare workers, I was um, reluctant to go down the route of high flow therapy. But again, I'd say that my position has changed somewhat insofar as I think um, the auction demand of the devices actually isn't so high. And now that we are able to monitor closely and understand our capacity, there would be facility to provide high flow nasal therapy to some patients in our area. I think we proved that it can be effective, especially because we did use it, and Mervyn will talk to this, we did use it for patients who couldn't tolerate CPAP. And I think we're confident now with the trained nurses, we wouldn't be exposing ourselves to high leaks from the nasal cannulae. Mervyn, what do you think? Yeah, no, I, I very much endorse what you're saying. Um, the thing I'd add, which I think reinforces Ronan's point that um, NIV BiPAP wasn't needed in the majority of patients because their breathing was good. You know, they, yeah. they were having good tidal volumes, but they just weren't oxygenating. And uh, if you looked at the carbon dioxide levels, they were very rarely elevated as a sign that the patient was tiring. So the patient may be struggling to breathe, but you weren't necessarily seeing very high carbon dioxide levels in this initial sort of compliant lung phase. Um, and again, we were using uh, quite a lot of high flow nasal oxygen. Um, sometimes the patients just needed that alone. And sometimes, you know, I think if any of you have tried CPAP or you'll be familiar with it, it's nice to give the patient a break so they can drink, eat, and uh, just, you know, have a break from the CPAP. And so we could often alternate between CPAP and periods of uh, high flow nasal oxygen. And it was therefore a, a means of helping the patient tolerate it, for, especially if they were requiring days and days of treatment. Super, thank you both. We had one question actually, which was then, have you been using CPAP at all after ventilation as people are kind of going back onto the wards? Yeah, um, so again, sometimes when we extubated patients, um, we used um, CPAP high flow to support them. And uh, some of these patients, you know, so what we did was then transition these patients to Ronan and the, his respiratory unit. And I think sometimes you continue to CPAP there. So it was a very, for us, in intensive care, it was extremely useful to be able to decant the patients and free up the intensive care beds for the really, really bad patients. And Ronan and his team did a brilliant job for us because uh, they really looked after us very, very well. It doesn't just come as a huge surprise, of course they did. <laughs> um, we've got a couple of questions around how you set up the flow. So, well, partly how do you set the flow up and then um, any monitoring system on an ongoing basis for tracking the flow rates? So the, it's, um, I, it's quite interesting. I, I would encourage you to try it yourself and you'll, if you've never tried CPAP, it's a, it's a good thing to learn on yourself. And um, certainly with the training, we, we were encouraging um, people who weren't used to it to try it or see others try it. And, there, there's a sweet spot because if you're not giving enough flow, the, pay, the, the, the person having the CPAP is struggling more. And if you're giving too much, it's actually less comfortable and you're obviously wasting oxygen. And so there are a number of ways of looking at the flow. So you can look at the flutter valve in the mask, uh, 
you can look a feel on the back of your hand there's a a continuous flow coming out of the CPAP and there, there should essentially throughout the respiratory cycle there shouldn't be prolonged periods where you lose that flow so you're allowed a very transient drop in the flow but it should be coming out hitting the back of your hand if you put your hand against it and also the the engineers created a, a little flutter valve that went in the the circuit and so you could modulate the flow just so that it kept a little bit open and that corresponded very nicely with patient comfort so me trying it on myself i i could tell you when it felt most comfortable and that corresponded to not too little flow but not too high flow so it was a nice way of optimizing the flow to the individual patient and then the nurses or the doctors could adjust the flow to the patient's needs so if the patient was resting you know they may need a lower flow rate but if they were being rolled and turned supine that would require effort so you could turn the flow rate up to accommodate their increased work of breathing and when they settle down you could turn it down again i, I don't know if you want to add to that ronan no, I think that's right. I think it's, um, it's actually one of those things that I think is much harder to describe than to demonstrate. <laughs> I think um, once people, and I, I speak really thinking about how the, tr the nurses found training most helpful, and it really was seeing it in practice and getting used to um, using the, the, the equipment, moving the knobs, understanding how sensitive they are or aren't, and looking at how the valve in the system moves. I think it is actually quite intuitive once you have your hands on, on the kit. Thank you both. It's probably worth saying to everyone as well that if you go on our website and we'll put the link in the, um, in the chat, there is a training video that was developed by the UCLH teams, which, which does show you how, how they do the flow setting with um, one of Mervyn and Raymond's colleagues, um, David Burley. So, so probably worth having a watch of that. It's, it's about seven, eight minutes. It's also available on YouTube, but that might help with some of these um, questions around how these Ventura devices specifically were used. Brilliant. So just moving on to some other questions. So that we've got a few questions actually around um, kind of adaption of the devices for use on neonatal or pediatric patients. I don't know if, if either of you would like to comment on that. No, it's not something that we've specifically explored for, for the Ventura's, is it? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll put my hands up and say I, I don't know. Um, again, it depends how, how old and how big your paediatric patient is because uh, you can have uh, rather large 12-year-olds. Um, so I, I must admit we've not tried it on children. Mm -hmm. um, there's no reason why it shouldn't work. I think probably a neonate, the flows will be too high. You can turn the flow right. rate down. But, you know, thankfully COVID doesn't seem to affect... Uh, neonates or very small children so you know certainly in the UK there have been very few children who have needed admission I, I don't know Ronan if you want to add to that uh, I unfortunately don't have much to add to that um, so I think I'd, I'd leave it there I think um, like you say there wasn't much pediatric or neonatal disease in the UK um, so I'm not sure how much neither would be in that group, but I prefer to. Thank you. No, that's absolutely fine. Uh, we've, we've got a couple of questions around um, healthcare worker training and also the ratio of patients to number of healthcare workers, both for ventilators and for CPAPs, essentially how the two compare. Oh, gone. Ronan first, gone. Well, certainly for our ward, um, it was, there's a balance to strike between um, if you have a previously novice group of nurses who you're training in, in a new skill, you want to provide them with an environment that allows them to um, learn that skill with patients and be supported. So we were anxious not to, um, not to have too big a ratio between nurses and patients as we develop the unit. But as I was presenting in the slides, as the confidence in the nursing staff and physios increased, it allowed us to uh, dilute, whatever better word, the nursing ratios for the patients. 
and we would have been content um, with a one to four nursing ratio by about week four of our pandemic. Um, and that I'm saying nurses, it, it doesn't have to be nurses, whoever you've trained in that skill. So healthcare assistants in our, in our health system could do that. Um, and in other health systems, there'll be other people who can provide that, uh, that care. Mervyn. No, I, I uh, agree with what Ronan says. Um, the, the beauty about having a spontaneously ventilating patient is they're much, it's much easier and much more safe to look after these patients than a ventilated patient. Because clearly, if something goes wrong with the ventilator, uh, the tube blocks, there's a problem, then the patient is in prob uh, has a problem if the nurse at the bedside doesn't realize it or recognize it so yes you've got alarm capabilities and so forth of the ventilator but you know in the UK our, our general ratio was one nurse to one ventilated patient with COVID it had to go in our hospital one to four because we as I mentioned in my talk um, we took many patients from other hospitals and so our intensive care capacity essentially doubled um, and looking after ventilated patients was very difficult when we were very busy. So it was much easier to have the patient awake and it was easier for the nurses. Super, we've only got time for a couple more questions. Um, there, there was one question around the oxygen flow rates that are required. I think that's broadly been answered in the slides, but you can also look on our website. There's published data on our healthy volunteer studies that give give those um, oxygen flow rate data for patients with different works of breathing. So please do refer to that. One linked question is around the use of, um, for example, oxygen cylinders to drive these devices instead of the piped oxygen supply. Um, Merlin, did you want to just comment on that quickly? Yeah. So, you know, clearly the challenge is, you know, how much oxygen has your hospital got and how many other patients in the hospital are needing an oxygen supply. So obviously the cylinders, depending on the size of the cylinder, you'll know what the capacity of that cylinder is. Um, and then you've got to then divide that by the flow rate you're using. And that will tell you how many minutes or hours you have for that cylinder. I know in some hospitals, they have multiple cylinders all joined up. And so obviously you have a, a degree of a reservoir there. Um, as Ronan showed you with the data that, you know, in general with the Ventura, you're using somewhere between 12 liters per minute with comfortable breathing, at about 50% oxygen, but it, it will go up to about 50 liters a minute if you're using 90% oxygen and the patient is breathing hard. And so therefore you have to do the calculation and obviously you'll be monitoring your oxygen cylinder use to see how quickly that cylinder supply is being depleted. So it can be managed, but clearly if you have a pan hospital supply uh, with a, you know, a liquid oxygen, it makes life much easier. But unfortunately, you know, you, your hospital may not be that lucky to have that. Super, thank you. Thank you, Mervyn. And um, one question around how you determined failure in CPAPs that prompted you to then intubate the patients, what were your failure criteria? Um, I think basically the work of breathing, you know, if the patients were comfortable, that was a good sign. If, and sometimes you had these, you know, so-called happy hypoxia patients, they had horrible saturations, but they were comfortable. And so to me, it was obviously you look at the package of uh, clinical signs, but I, I thought the patient looking uncomfortable, beginning to struggle was a sign that these were the patients you needed to intubate. And uh, as I mentioned in my talk at the end, the patients with the high inflammatory markers, the high CRP levels, these were the ones. This was quite predictive as to who would need intubation. Uh, Rona, I don't know if you want to add to that. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, it's a good question because there's concern both in terms of uh, when to intubate, but also you can kind of apply the same question to uh, when to end the break-off CPAP. Um, so it's about signs of deterioration. Um, 
And as Mervyn said, it's a lot of clinical assessment at the bedside, which is difficult to um, quantify. It's a, a combination of signs of worker breathing. But obviously things like increasing respiratory rate, increasing heart rate and blood pressure um, are all signs of a patient failing. So those would add into our, our assessment. Um, I should probably mention at this point, we, we have uh, put together a paper detailing the uh, outcomes from our from our CPAP cohort, or actually our, our whole co cohort, including those on CPAP. And we're hoping that will be published in the next couple of weeks. And uh, that will include further data uh, speaking to some of those questions asked today. Thanks, Ray. Ray. Um, we've just got the last two questions that we'll try and just rattle through quickly just to make sure we've got everything covered. Um, one is around the comparison between a CPAP or an emergency stroke transport ventilator. Yeah. So uh, is that for delivering invasive ventilation or because you know, again, it depends on your transport ventilator. Some of them are more sophisticated than others. So um, a simple transport ventilator doesn't offer spontaneous supported breathing. And essentially you have a, a sort of a low level ventilator. Others are more sophisticated. So it depends very much on what you have available. Um, you know, and unfortunately um, there are so many transport ventilators available, it, it does, um, you have to then tailor it to what you've got. Brilliant. Um, one question around negative pressure rooms for non-invasive ventilation, do they make a difference? Good question. Um, so the guidelines in the UK is still that uh, we should, where possible, provide NIV, that is bi-level ventilation non-invasively in negative pressure side rooms, because that is the safest environment. Um, now, I don't think it's necessarily backed up by evidence. I think the, uh, the evidence in, included in those papers that I included in the slides doesn't really support that as, um, as an absolute necessity. But we would still um, run a system in which we would use our negative pressure side rooms first, and then our side rooms, and only when running out of class two would we then move into cohorted bays because that is the safest um, situation. But on the understanding at the beginning of this pandemic that we knew that we would run out of the, that capacity within days. So I think there's, a, there's, a, there's an ideal a sort of gold standard and then a, a real world sort of scenario that uh, you have to consider. Yeah. Thank you. I think a fi final question before we just wrap up. Um, does the change in the patient circuitry uh, make a difference to the flow rates and oxygen concentrations? Yeah, no, that's a, a very nice question. Yeah, the answer is yes. Um, I was quite shocked as a, a, a simple clinician to realise <laughs> quite the impact of um, the circuit. And we found, you know, our engineers were brilliant and they discovered that you can get quite big pressure drops at different parts of the circuit. You know, for example, um, with the valves or the the viral filters we put at the end and so we uh, found that that contributed a lot to the work of breathing of the patient and the comfort of the patient and therefore they needed a higher flow rate to compensate for that and so as part of the package of the Ventura it's not just the device but I mentioned in my talk it's having an optimized circuit and there's a company we work with very closely. It's British, but they have uh, links around the world called Intersurgical, who make very good equipment with very low resistances. So, you know, that's why we're trying to package our device with their consumables, their circuit, to facilitate, you know, the resistance and patient breathing. Super. Thank you, Mervyn. I think I think we'll have to close up on the the question and answer session there, just to give you a, a kind of quick summary of next steps and keeping in touch. After the event, um, the team will be in contact with you all to share our contact details for any further questions and also to circulate um, the, you know, the recording of, of the webinar, including subtitles in the different languages as we explained. There's also a survey that's going to be circulated, which would love it if you would be happy to um, to contribute to, you know, we, we're genuinely delighted and it's so wonderful to, to be able to do these webinars and to meet so many people from across the world who are thinking about CPAPs and 
it, it's brilliant to have this kind of community where hopefully we can all support each other. In terms of some specific um, resources that we have available online, uh, the team have, have circulated our website. There's quite a lot of information on there specifically about the UCL Ventura CPAP devices. That includes things like frequently asked questions, the instructional training videos, and all the documentation that we deliver with the devices in the UK. So um, clinical guidance documents and, and user manuals. And they're also available. Currently, they're translated into to Spanish and Portuguese as well. And we'll endeavour to continue our translation efforts as, as we get feedback from more and more groups internationally who are taking these forward. We also have a Facebook group set up, which is to connect um, people who are using CPACs and also looking to manufacture them. So that's a very kind of informal um, space where, to, where we can encourage peer-to-peer -peer support and ongoing discussions. Um, so please do sign up to that. And then the other thing to note is that um, there are our designs and manufacturing instructions available for download through, at zero cost through our website. So if, if teams within your countries are interested in taking forward um, manufacture in country, there is that resource available and we've got, we've got quite a lot of support available to support those kind of groups. So again, please do let us know if you have any questions. And finally, I think just a, a huge thank you for joining. It's a pleasure to have met you all. Please do stay in touch and um, good luck with all of your, your efforts. <laughs>